Looking forward to this for over a year. We're so pleased that you have come to deliver the Davis Lectures. So how would you uh, describe this fellow? Uh, don't answer that, no. Uh, uh, prophet, preacher, pastor, professor, champion with Patty, for the poor of Statesville, um, a magnificent leader of our congregation, and a gift to the city of Statesville. Uh, Gary, uh, we welcome you gladly. Uh, may God's spirit and truth be with you. Well, well, well. <laughs> what have we done here? Good morning and shalom. I'm glad to be here with you. I have looked forward to this time. And Carol, please do not be embarrassed about hesitating to read the text. I was hesitant to choose it. Uh, I am not known to be one who proclaims a lot from the book of Revelation. A mentor of mine, known to a few of us here, Dr. Frank Stagg, told me, though, years ago, look at Revelation. There's something there for us to consider. And just because that book has been misused and abused, distorted and corrupted, let it go and find something there which is meaningful. And I thought again during Diane's prayer, the emphasis on courage, for that is the theme of the book of Revelation. Be of good courage regardless of what's happening. And so I would imagine some eyebrows arched when they saw that the text for today was from Revelation. It really is only the text for this moment. That is not what I'm going to build on during the Davis lectures. But the one, the visionary there, has a way of seeing churches in a wide area at his time. Some of them come off pretty good. They get a good recommendation. They are commended, but then always they're warned just a little bit there is more to do, moving on to others who have a lot to do. And they're confronted with that, but they are still encouraged. Until finally, the last of those seven churches, the church at Laodicea, basically lukewarm, moderate, middle of the road, playing it safe. And the writer says, I'm just going to spit you out. It troubles me that the description of those seven churches may describe something of church life in our own time. There are some to be commended, although there is more to do. There are others maybe confronted, but still possible. But there are so many others that just something drastic needs to happen. Can it be that they will be spewed out? It is frightening. Play it safe churches. The political pundit from Texas, Jim Hightower, is fond of saying, middle of the road? There ain't nothing in the middle of the road but yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> Going to the extreme right, some do that in a fanatical kind of way, but they are losing ever so many people. The rest often just playing it safe, losing their prophetic edge, losing their involvement in the world. It is very sad. So that is descriptive, I think, of what's happening. And yet, as I say, that's not what I want to build on. I want to build on something else beginning tonight, and I'm going to give you a homework assignment. 
You'll have time to do it this afternoon before the game starts or before the lecture begins, whatever. You need to go home and take 15, 30 minutes at most to read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And if you can't read all three chapters, at least read Matthew 5, verses 1 through about 20 or so. That is your homework assignment, and there will be a test. <laughs> so I need for you to do that. Radical religion. Radical faith. And by that, I do not mean extremism. Please don't let that word frighten you. I do not mean fanaticism. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But rather that the way of Jesus was a radical way, and radicality is understood there as going to the root of something. What is at the root of churches being all over the map and not understanding their calling? What is at the root of our personal difficulties and struggles? What is at the root of national and global interactions and problems? What's there and how can we cut through so very much and begin to address it? That's something of what we will work with. So I encourage you and, and try to read it with different eyes, try to put on a different set of lens, and as you read, recognize that you are reading radical material. That is what we will build on. I've been at this long enough to know something of the code language that happens, and I hear it all the time, and in recent years, I have heard it more and more in the classroom at Mitchell, we have all kinds of students, some still in high school, some just out of high school, some older adults who usually are the very best students, but always, always there is that group of young students who've been in Sunday school and church all their life. They can quote back verbatim what the preacher says, and they, they understand it. It's boxed, it's completed, it's understood. So one day in class, something came up um, about some churches and especially some pastors living in multi-million dollar houses. I, I do have some problem with that. <laughs> There's not a whole long list of things that deeply trouble me, but religious wealth is one of them. And so it came up and I begin to just gently nudge and question about, you know, following somebody who didn't even have a place to lay his head and yet living in multi-million dollar houses. What is that? And the response began to come <laughs> from those young minds who know more about God, humanity, and the universe than God does. <laughs> <clears throat> and the emphasis was, but you've got to see what they do, not only around us, but worldwide. So many people are coming to the gospel. They are preaching the word. Code. Preaching the word. What does that even mean? It means this. At some point in time, hopefully, you will have it arranged and people will be around you and support you so that you go through certain steps. You walk down, you sit down, you write down, and then you get put down under some water or sprinkled or something. You are baptized and they run you through like a string of sausage and you are saved. And then, in time, you go to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is, but that is not the essence and the gist of the gospel. There is much more to preach the word than that. In working on this for today, something kept coming back that happened 
for us just in recent weeks. And it is a personal, a deeply personal issue for me. But because of what has gone on, I will share it with you. I have, we have, a young relative who lives in another state. And a few weeks ago, Facebook blew up from that part of the country on the part of that young person's family. He's nine years old. And it was announced that he was going to be baptized. It was a time of celebration and joy, and they even had the video of that taking place in the baptistry. And I make no light of that. It is a time of great celebration and joy. He's a good kid, good-looking, sharp, funny, loves life and gets into it. He lost his dad at the age of 40 a couple of years ago. And he is being raised by a mother and grandmother and several, a couple of grandmothers and others who love him deeply. So some of the dynamics are in place, and they were thrilled to know that he was going to be baptized, join the church, start that process. But the reason it is so deeply personal to me is I know that context. I know where he is planted. I know that he is surrounded in that area and he could go to almost any part of our country and be surrounded by churches that preach the word. He is also in the context of folk who are deeply prejudicial. And they don't work to change that. He is also in the context where he is taught, do unto others before they get a chance to shaft you. He is in the context where violence can always be explained as necessary and be explained away if necessary. That is his context. And that precious little boy doesn't have a chance. As far as understanding the radicality of the gospel, he won't get that message unless somewhere along the way someone comes, as was my case, thank God, and has increasingly been my case, and increasingly the case for so many of you, it, I don't know if it'll happen because he's not exposed to it, but maybe someday someone will come along and put an arm around him and say, let's talk a little bit. There's a whole lot more to this than what you've been told and what you seem to understand. I hope that he will come to recognize the radicality of the gospel that that love which comes from God to everyone all the time without exception is a radical kind of love. But along with that love comes a calling to engage in a radical sort of way. Also back to the classroom, because that's where I spend a good bit of my time and thinking time. I start every world religion class with a discussion of the axial age. You can Google it, look it up, read it, it's pretty clear. The axial age, really as presented from a 19th century scholar, philosopher, Carl Jaspers, talks about a period of time from 900 to 200 BCE, 700 years, when approximately four regions of the world, India, China, surrounding areas there in Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Greece, began to 
spend their time not together, but in their own way asking what is the human problem and what is the answer. And they went over that for a long time and in those particular geographical regions, they recorded their responses. And the phenomenon is that those four regions never got together. India never had a conference. The Middle East didn't have a week-long retreat where people came together and they exchanged. That didn't happen. They did not have contact. But they came up with the same understanding. And they said, the human problem is ego. Ego. And they weren't talking about it just as it could be in a helpful way. You know, ego is what kicks us out of bed every morning and gets us going. There's a place for that. But ego run amok where it really is about me and mine regardless the circumstance. The human problem is ego and the response, the solution to that problem is compassion. Hinduism taught that, Buddhism taught that, Sikhism has taught that, Christianity has taught that, Judaism, Islam, in every one of them. Greek philosophy even expresses the same. The problem is ego run amok, and the response to it is compassion. So before we dive in tonight, I now give you an exercise. I'll take a few seconds. I want you to stop, shut everything else off, kind of wash your mind for a minute, and I want you to think of something. It could be locally, right here close by, community, region. Maybe it's something national, maybe even international. I want you to think of something that kind of eats at you and you recognize that it is a serious problem. Now, are you aware of any compassion being applied to that problem and somehow some way somewhere are you in on the application of that compassion the radicality of the gospel a love that is so radical that it accepts you regardless you're in you don't have to go through all, you know, ceremonially, it may be good. Sign that card, get baptized. But you're in. You are accepted. Now, can you hear the radical call? Amen.